Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar on surgical instruments back to basics. Just got a, a couple more people joining, but it's um, it's time to get started. So um, thank you for taking the time out to join us today. Um, very excited that we had uh, over 125 people register for today's webinar. And um, hopefully uh, you're not all too sleepy after lunchtime. I'm sure uh, hearing about surgical instruments is, uh, is something that's definitely going to keep everybody awake. So a few key points for today, and I'm just going to start sharing my slides. OK, hopefully you can all see that now. So a, key, a few key points for today, just to introduce myself. I'm Daniel Call. I'm the Managing Director of Surgical Holdings. So Surgical Holdings um, has produced a series of CPD accredi accredited webinars. Basically, these are going to cover they're going to cover a variety of different subjects, um, including endoscopy, electro electrosurgical, uh, different subject matters around surgical instrumentations as well. But if there's other things that come up along the way that you think you'd like to hear about, please let me know and we'll try and factor these in. Um, questions. You'll see on, on your panel, you should have a, um, a tab where you can send questions across. Um, I'll take some of these at the end, but I, I, I think if you want to send them as we're going along, I'll, I'll probably pause halfway through and try and pick up any that are relevant to, to sort of that point in time. Also, give me a bit of a break from clicking through the slides. Um, and um, we've created a feedback form on here. So if you wouldn't mind after you've completed, after we've completed the webinar, if you could log on and just complete a few questions, that will give us your details to enable us to um, uh, produce the CPD certificates. So there, uh, just to explain, they'll come directly from, from CPD, Continuing Professional Development. They'll be awarded for uh, an hour's um, CPD points. And um, for everybody who can go to the trouble of doing the forms, we're gonna do a prize draw where uh, very exciting on our screen there we have um, a pack of uh, Rick Schultz's instrument coaching cards that we're going to be doing a live draw on that uh, Leah um, our marketing manager doesn't know it yet but she's gonna be doing a live draw on that so uh, so that we're going to give those to, to obviously whoever's lucky enough to, to be drawn out of the hat um, so I don't think there's anything else really to add um, other than a, a slight disclaimer that obviously I'm not going to be able to cover everything surgical instruments wise I'll try and give a good generic roundup of most most things and um, the areas we're going to be covered covering today. So we're going to look at the orange, origins of surgical instruments. Where did everything start? Um, materials, what sort of materials are used in instrumentation and why? What we should be looking at for quality. So um, quality uh, being that standards and other quality elements of, of surgical instrumentation. Features and identification. So, what what does particular instruments look like, and why, and what why them what, why might they have those common features? And also maintenance um, that we're going to discuss towards the end. So, let's start with origins. Um, so, surgical instruments go back many thousands of years. Um, just to run through this brief graphic, which gives a bit of a history of that. So you'll see that uh, instruments themselves have, have been found dating back to um, as early as the Neolithic times. So that's um, that's the sort of end of the Stone Age. Certainly the Iron Age, there was evidence that um, instruments or types of instruments were being used or, or, or fashioned um, using iron. And then, of course, Romans, ancient Egypt, there's been... Um, there's been vast evidence of, of surgical instrumentation being used. Obviously, things have progressed over the years with instruments. We had the introduction of stainless steel in the early 1900s, which is a massive game changer from the point of view of the cleanability of instrumentation. And of course, uh, what you're able to do with the surgical instruments themselves. And, and I'll explain a bit more about that as we go. Uh, obviously, we're up to the sort of modern day now where we have um, wide use of um, minimally invasive surgery, so laparoscopic instrumentation, and of course now robotic instrumentation. So when I began to look at the, the slides of this presentation, I, I was looking at 
thinking of the origins of instruments and thought, well, the British were, were, were renowned surgical instrument makers. And um, I came across this paper, which is a, an instrument maker, a historical perspective. So I thought, well, this will surely give me um, some information around um, how credible we are as instrument makers. Um, it's a very, very interesting paper, and of course, as uh, uh, does indeed do that. Um, but I was just in, I was just uh, amused by this comment that um, British surgical instrument makers have, on the whole, been very, um, very innovative. In have not been very innovative in the design of their products. Sorry, I had the panel in front of there. So, yeah, fairly damning in in regards to the British surgical instrument maker, I of which I am one of those. Um, but let's look at how these designs come about of the surgical instruments. As we can see, and, and rather on, rather probably backing up that statement here, we have um, an artery forcep from the late 1900s that, that, was, des that was designed, um, one of the first that was designed, which is uh, similar to a sort of Spencer Wells forcep. Um, and you'll see on the right, the, um, the 2021 version of that, there's not much difference really in that in the design of it. So I guess you, you would say that, yeah, ha we haven't been particularly innovative in this particular case. Um, you'll see the slight differences, the box joint there um, on, the, um, uh, on the instrument, articulating the instrument compared to a screw joint. Arguably, perhaps we, you know, we may be going back to looking at things like screw joints where the device can be taken apart and cleaned a lot easier. You'll also see the rack there that, um, that is obviously uh, familiar on the right to the, the modern day instrument that we see on um, on artery forceps uh, and other instruments. And there's a slightly different internal rack on, on the one on the left. Overall, of course, the major advancement is the is the um, introduction of stainless steel, um, which there would have been a plated um, a plated material from back in the late 1900s. So nomenclature, what's in the name of the instrument? How do we come about naming a surgical instrument and how, and how does that possibly make sense. Well, generally it follows a, a pattern, so a description of the action that device the device performs, a mention of the inventor, and also the um, a, a, a comment in terms of the term of what the device does itself. Um, so if we look at something like a Spencer Wells artery forcep, the surgeon who invented the device, indeed, uh, Mr. Spencer Wells, and then artery, where the, where the device is used on the artery and forcep. So it's broken down like that. And to give you a bit more uh, information or insight into that, it all starts with a medical issue, really. Um, you'll see this uh, poor, poor chap on the on the screen, or or, or maybe lady who has had has got a, a rather severe problem with her hip. Um, so we look at the area, which is bone, which is orthopedics. Um, the term for bone being osteo. Osteo meaning bone. And then we look at otomy. Otomy meaning cut into. Ostomy to create an opening. So if we put all those all those terms together, we have a capenar osteotome. Obviously, osteo osteo meaning bone, and and the other parts of the, of the word making up the, the cutting into an, an opening, opening of tissue. Of course, the surgeon's name is mentioned too, which is Capener here, but it gives you a bit of a basic breakdown as to how those names of surgical instruments are structured. Another uh, another comment here, um, again, not particularly uh, complimentary of the uh, British surgical instrument makers from the same journal article. In general, the typical surgical instrument maker seems to have been very conservative and to have deferred entirely to the whims of this customer the surgeon, which I guess you can't really argue with because every instrument generally is named alongside a surgeon or created with a surgeon. Um, obviously, that may be changing nowadays slightly with robotics, um, but generally speaking, the heritage instruments are all named with, with surgeons' names. So Norman Capener here, very, very famous orthopaedic surgeon from the Royal Devon and Exeter, indeed, um, the Capener osteotome. So let's now look at material selection and um, how we go about deciding what materials are used in surgical instruments um, and indeed how these are safe to use. So the image on my screen, which um, has, uh, I've actually got a piece of that here. So this indeed is actually iron ore. Um, 
iron makes up the majority of surgical instruments, approximately 70%, 70 to 80 percent are iron in the composition of a surgical instrument. There are other elements as well, such as um, carbon, carbon, nickel, and chromium for different reasons. Um, but iron ore is very, very important, I think, in this story in respect that you've got to look at the colour of the iron ore and really um, relate that to, uh, to, to what can happen to your surgical instruments in terms of the rusting colour. So it's, it's, you'll be very familiar with that, with that colouring and my golden gate is nice and rusty and, and, and has that sort of same, same tone. And I'll touch on that a bit more. So this is iron oxide. And this is iron in its most stable state. So the important thing to remember, and by that being its most stable state, is it's the state that iron wants to get back to. So even if it's part of a, the composition in a surgical instrument, um, ideally it will do whatever it can do to get back to iron oxide in its most stable state. Of course, when we're working with iron, um, iron ore, um, pieces of iron ore like that, uh, it goes through a smelting process to extract those uh, those. Um, the different elements that are used to make up stainless steel um, furnace that might look something like this. And if we look at the world iron ore mining map, um, obviously it's quite um, quite well known that a lot of surgical instruments now produced in, in, in the sort of Far East, so China, um, India, Pakistan, those sort of places. Well, it's no great coincidence because a lot of the iron, in, iron ore mining now takes place in those countries. And indeed, um, Steel was produced mostly in those countries too. You'll see China, India, Japan, which is a, a very big producer of surgical instrument stainless steel that, that, that's used through Pakistan. Um, obviously, using those steels, providing they're all to the, to the correct specification, that is the key point. And when you're manufacturing surgical instruments, having the right composition um, is everything. If you don't have the right composition, then there are a number of failings that, uh, that may take place for the instruments. So if we look at the uh, the standards, and this is taken from the Association for British Health Tech Industries Surgical Instrument Guidebook that we produced a few years back, I'm just going to highlight if my cursor is working this this standard here, which is ISO 7153. So ISO 7153 gives you um, basically the different compositions of the different types of surgical instruments. So for each surgical instrument, there's a specific composition. That is um, how much um, how much carbon is it, is in it, how much um, chromium is in it, and I'll, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Just to highlight, in uh, we also have British standards for other areas of surgical instruments. So, for instance, for scissors, for dissecting forceps, for instruments with pivot points, and um, and of course we've got to mention how we legally put those manufacture and put those devices on the market. At the moment, um, in the UK, we're still using uh, the Medical Device Directive um, as, as it is now presented for, for, for us to use because of, uh, because of Brexit. There is, of course, the MDR, which um, is, is a European standard or European directive, um, and, and that determines CE marking and how you can CE mark a device. Uh, UK CA marking will be the, a new mark that will be placed on um, instruments that are placed on the market in the UK and um, uh, other manufacturing companies selling into the UK will need to eventually have UK CA mark their uh, their instruments but it's causing quite a few headaches along the way for sure um, so watch that watch this space on this the other standard of course to mention which a lot of you listening will probably have already in your in your departments is ISO 13485 which is a quality standard designed for medical devices Let's have a look at stainless steel now, and, and actually I found out a fact when I was looking at this that I myself did not know. Um, so in 1812, Harry Brearley of the uh, Brown Firth Research Laboratory in Sheffield, England, while seeking, and this is a bit I didn't know, a corrosion-resistant alloy for gun barrels, he discovered um, industrialised martensitic stainless steel. So that is the alloy. Um, that we use for manufacturing surgical instruments, Martin Citic stainless steel. And um, Firth and Vickers uh, went on to be a, a very well known producer of um, steel and forgings up in Sheffield um, for, for, for many, many years. Having a look at the composition of steel now, I just want to explain a bit about the types of, in, the, the types of uh, composition that you might find. So the highlighted rows up the top here 
you'll see the Martin City steel grades A, B, C, D. Um, really the easiest part to look at here is the carbon level. You'll see the carbon level changes. And what carbon allows you to do in, in Martin City stainless steel is after you've manufactured the device, you can harden it. So the more carbon it has in it, the harder it will be. You'll also see that generally speaking, the chromium levels go, that, go up as um, the carbon go up. Um, really this will enhance the corrosion resistance and the ability for the device to be passivated which I'll also mention shortly. So looking at going back to this Kaepner uh, osteotome here um, obviously it needs to be very very sharp it needs to be very hard uh, it's going to be chipping into bone repeatedly um, as we know so we, we don't want it to lose an edge um, and it needs to do what it, what what it's designed for so bearing that in mind the carbon is of high carbon, so 0.42 to 0.5. The chromium is 12.5 to 14.5. And just to highlight there, the Rockwell 50 to 58. That's a high, that's a, a high hardness um, to, uh, tolerance level for uh, for Rockwell. Rockwell is the measurement of the hardness. So um, each surgical instrument will have a Rockwell level. For something like an artery forcep, you'll want that to be a bit flexible, so it'll have a much lower Rockwell hardness level. And indeed, it will therefore have a lower carbon um, level and generally probably a slightly lower chromium as well. So what does the chromium do? Um, well, the chromium in a surgical instrument, that, um, that allows us to um, corrosion, have corrosion protect, uh, protection on the instrument itself. So the chromium reacts with oxygen, um, creating chromium oxide. And this is what we know as, or some, some of you may know as the passive layer. So this is a very, very thin, um, as little as 30 nanomicrons thin, um, invisible layer. It provides, as I mentioned, corrosion resistance. Um, it sits on top of the device. This corrosion resistance, this passive layer, does occur naturally just through reaction with oxygen or chromium. When we're manufacturing surgical instruments, we actually achieve this artificially. And, and how we do this is, when we finish manufacturing the device or, or indeed repairing it, we, uh, we treat it with, with an acid. So that may be um, nitric acid or citric acid, something like that. Nitric is quite aggressive, quite dangerous stuff. So generally um, it's, it's citric acid nowadays, but that creates that, um, that passivation. And that is to, um, uh, to uh, a standard that is generally um, uh, an ASTM that we work to. Apologies if you've got my news flash up there, really. I'm not quite sure how that's how to get rid of that, so I have to go with that. Um, and yeah, just to mention that it's a very thin layer, very susceptible to damage. This can be damage that's occurred through minerals, scratches, and indeed possibly um, laser marking as well, uh, if laser marking isn't treated after with a suitable solution or passivation. So this is not what we want to see, which is rusty stainless steel. This is stainless steel that has had the passive layer damaged in some way. Um, iron plus oxygen plus water equals hydrated iron oxide, which we know as rust. And indeed, you, know, you can see quite clearly that there's a very, very close similarity to that of iron ore. It's the iron trying to get back to its most stable state. And these are some of the challenges when you're looking at um, Manufacturing stainless, uh, manufacturing stainless steel surgical instruments and indeed reprocessing the instrumentation, just how diverse the potable water map, that's the tap water map throughout England and Wales is here. Um, you'll see there's a variety of different sources, um, rivers, streams and groundwater. And what that means is obviously when the instruments are so washed, if they were to be washed with just potable water only, untreated, you get a, a huge variation in mineral content here. Um, you'll see uh, in Cambridge here, it has a very um, a very high chloride level versus London. So chloride um, can uh, can can help cause pitting, rusting, pitting in surgical instrumentation. And um, you've also got uh, things like alkalinity, the higher alkalinity through across different regions. There's lots of things to consider here. Obviously, generally speaking, people use treatment plants, so they'll use RO uh, treatment plants, maybe RO steam for sterilization, but it doesn't always mean that that will be um, used throughout the process. Um, so just to 
So further, obviously, we've got different qualities of water, which may be used in different places. Of course, you've got tap water, washer disinfectors, steam generators. Um, and if those mi minerals are in the potable water, potentially, if it's not treated, it can damage that passive layer and potentially start to deteriorate the surgical instruments. It's just something to be aware of, of course. Chlorides can be detrimental to the surface of the instrument, as I've mentioned, um, can also be found in obviously organic blood residues. Uh, here's a picture of a, a, an instrument that has surface damage and some pitting that's, be that's begun to happen to that instrument. Okay. If anybody's got any questions, please, please file them over while I'm talking. I'll see them pop up and I can pick them up as we go. If not, we'll, uh, we'll leave it till the end. So message here is quality is more than just looking pretty. This is what appears on my screen as a nice, bright, shiny surgical instrument. Hopefully the same, you see the same thing on yours. But as manufacturers, there's a lot more to it. Um, as I've mentioned, the materials, uh, the, the, the factor of the, how the devices are handled and used and, and, um, and the frailties of, of the passivation layer. As manufacturers, you have to do your due diligence when you're using um, stainless steels to make sure that they actually meet the correct British standards and that if it's something that um, you need to meet, a standard you need to meet for a certain device, that it has the correct composition there. Um, this is a, an example of a certificate that we in-house um, use when we test our materials. Um, we manufacture big implants as well, so this is something that we do as standard routinely. And surface finish is also something that often gets overlooked. Um, this is taken from a paper by Honus and Harrison from the Stainless Steel um, Industry Association, which I found very interesting because if we look at a lot of aged instruments, they'll often have a lot of scratches and, 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 and marks and staining. Uh, and the result, the, the, the outcome of the research was that basically it was found that uh, the smoother the surface, the more corrosion resistant that the stainless steel is. That is because when the uh, when water hits um, the device, it flashes off quickly. That's why with things like serrations um, and jaws, uh, quite often you can get water sitting in them. Obviously, they're a rougher surface. Common sense is the smoother the device, the, the, the quicker the, the, um, the water will flash off. Um, and we're decreasing the wettability. If you have a rougher surface, for instance, at the top there, you've got RA of 1.0 microns, that resulted in a poor um, accelerated salt spray test uh, because of the rougher surface. So the water sits on there and it's more, less likely to run off. The same will apply, of course, with blood and other debris when the devices are used during surgery. Uh, just to show an example of what can be achieved with different surface finishes, here is some of our own instruments. You'll see a really, really bright, polished, ultra smooth finish on the um, distant end of the instrument that's going to be used in the patient. Um, the part, well, obviously, of course, we really want to make sure is uh, as clean as, as possible and as corrosion resistant. And then the back end, uh, which is like a wet bead glass, which still provides that um, anti glare for the surgeon. But it's really, you know, we, we need to start moving on with how we're thinking about surface finish and, and looking at different ways. Uh, how we can optimise cleaning depending on the surface finish of instrumentation, in my opinion. So questions so far, we don't appear to have any. I'll try and have a look. Uh, no, nope. no questions as yet. So I will plough on. So instrument features and identification. This is a very, uh, a very vast subject matter here, and obviously with I think 5,000 different instruments, I can't cover everything, but one of the first things to mention is uh, single use or reusable. And the eagle eyed viewer here will see that I've managed to get two single use uh, symbols facing different ways. But ultimately, uh, the message is obviously you can get instruments that are reusable or single use. Both play their part very much so in the marketplace today. Um, of course, you should not reuse single use instruments unless there are some extreme circumstances where you're able to repress process these. I don't believe in the UK that we do, do do that. Perhaps somebody on the call who's in sterile services could, could confirm that for me. But um, generally speaking, yeah, you'll see a mix of these used in surgery nowadays. Um, single use playing a big part in delicate instrumentation, such as ENT, um, maybe some ophthalmics, uh, of course, things that are difficult to clean, suction tubes. 
but also bearing in mind obviously the environmental environmental impacts of uh, potentially of that um, and reusable instruments which are obviously you know, dominate most instrumentation across um, across the instrumentation spectrum um, uh, we're in, we're a reusable instrument company we also do some single use products so let's have a look at common features on surgical instruments now what you might see what those features are called and where you might see them so let's start off with the uh, the box joint that I mentioned previously that's this bit here um, provides strength uh, perhaps a bit tricky to clean at times and also um, potential hotspot for, uh, for for instruments to to hold debris or to to potentially have some corrosion issues um, they're found on artery forceps um, also needle holders screw joint if you hear that term generally screw joints are found on scissors very very um, familiar to see a real screw on a on a on a scissor and, and actually as instrument makers it's quite good because you can take them apart easily and, and repair them ratchets which you can just see here which i can't because it's under my panel uh, so yeah on, on self-retaining retractors you'll see this ratchet here sometimes a slightly more modern version is what we call an internal rack which has a, a sort of fenestration or a gap through the middle of it teeth um, terminology teeth used on um, forceps so tissue forceps here we have, um, and I'll show you those a bit closer in a minute. Uh, rack is this part, which um, is generally used to clip, clamp the instrument together, and so it holds when it's either clamping on tissue or holding a, a, a needle. Um, and you wouldn't expect that to, to to drop off while that's in use. That should be set to a certain standard, so um, that locks in when it's being used. Scissor blades, obviously, I think fairly self-explanatory. Lumens, the term lumen uh, is a strange one, but it basically means a hole that's running through an instrument. So um, suction tubes typically have lumens and um, finish is, I've, I've mentioned just previously slightly, the difference in finish, finish could be bright polish, it could be satin finished, it could be a bead blast finish. There's lots of different finishes and that's basically the different tones on the instrument surface. I'll try and find a prop. I've got one close to me. So yeah, there's there's different finishes that you can obviously achieve just through using different um, different polishing techniques and finishing techniques. Tungsten carbide um, is used on needle holders, and these are these jaws in here. You'll see those in a bit more detail. Um, I'm just about to mention serrations and atraumatic teeth on the next slide. Bows, of course, are the ring pe ring pieces that are um, uh, that are on the end of scissors or a um, variety of different instruments, of course. So let's have a look at jaw types. Well, a traditional serrated jaw you'll see here is fairly coarse, and that's something that you'll see on artery forceps, um, mosquito forceps. Uh, Spencer Wells, I mentioned there, is a very popular artery forcep that is sold in the UK. Um, but when we want to be a bit more delicate, uh, you, there'll be something known as an atraumatic jaw, and you'll see that essentially it's the same serration. Um, a bit finer, but just generally cut away. So the, the surface to area of that serrated part of the jaw is reduced to obviously reduce the impact of the pressure on the tissue and potential damage to the patient there. Um, that's the sort of thing you might see on a Satinsky forcep. We've got one there. There are obviously other um, other examples of, of forceps where you would find that type of jaw. Um, Coolies, of course, Debakies. And then just some other different different ends of, that you might see on instruments. So uh, Alice tissue forceps here, you've got the interlocking teeth um, that you might also see on a dissecting forcep, perhaps sort of one into that's two into three teeth there. You'll get one into two teeth, three into four, five, five into six, depends on the, the, the design of the, uh, the instrument, how the surgeon designed it. Uh, the Duval tissue forceps there, something I flagged up that's completely different. Uh, it's got like a fenestrated end there with a with a serration that um, uh, with a triangular shape. And just to mention that you get atraumatic jaws also on dissecting forceps. So this is a debakey atraumatic dissecting forcep. Again, the idea is to reduce the potential to to damage tissue when you're being when it's being worked on. So uh, this is a quick look. I have had a question pop up. Uh, give me a moment.
So just had a question here just around why martensitic steel is used. Um, well, it's a carbon, the basis of it is it's a, it's a magnetic carbon containing steel. The reason it's used is it can be hardened. So um, the importance of that is, is in things like um, uh, osteotomes, if you didn't harden it, you'd use it once and it would go blunt. So martensitic steel enables you to do that. So yeah, just to uh, just to pick up on that one, I'll come to the others that probably look a bit more relevant for it, for the end as we as we go through now. So identifying instruments by by their design, um, Mikindo and Gillies are something that if you're learning about surgical instruments might look quite familiar on the trays um, that you, when you're looking at them. You have a Gillies which has got this sort of horizontal grip, and then Mikindo's has got a longitudinal serration. And that's very very distinguishable for a for a Makindo. Um, so generally speaking, a Gillies is one to two teeth. So when you see a forcep that looks like that, it's likely to be a Gillies. Um, it's quite a fine forcep. And if you see a Makindo on the train, it's got a longitudinal serration. Generally speaking, it's a serrated uh, forcep. So you might have a Gillies and a and a Makindo. We they have we been one one into two teeth Makindos come up along the way just to really confuse things. But generally speaking. Gillies 1 to 2, Makindo serrated, and that's how you'll distinguish those designs. So let's have a look now at retractors. There's um, a variety of different retractors. First of all, you've got the basic sort of handheld retractor, Cocker Langenbeck or Langenbeck, um, as we'd uh, know them in the UK. You've got um, uh, self retaining retractors, things like Norfolk and Norwich here. Uh, my cursor, now not working. There we go. Norfolk and Norwich. So look, like this retractor here obviously self-retaining because it, you click it on the rack and it holds itself open. Travers, Wheatlanders, Wests, lots of different variety of these. And then you've got another, I guess, self also self-retaining when it's put in place. Um, it would it would self-retain once it's retracted. These sort of like goalpost style retractors that generally you'll you'll see in um, sort of cardiothoracic surgery. Uh, for sort of opening cavities in the chest. So um, there's lots and lots of different varieties. Of those. Very delicate ones, such as IMA retractors, which might be um, actually not always stainless steel. They might be titanium as well. I believe some of the blades might be aluminium because weight is key. So, but generally speaking, they're the sort of three different types of retractors that you'll see. Other than this type, which is a slightly more innovative variety. So this is the uh, Bookwater retractor. And this means that basically nobody really has to hold the retractor blades. So there's a, there's a ring, a table post which goes onto the operating table, and the retractor blades are put in place. But put in place, they're ratcheted on. They've got little ratchets that basically um, allow you to um, to retract to the angle or, or or to the the depth that you that you require. And and indeed, then the surgeon can can uh, can crack on and obviously uh, and operate. Uh, funnily enough, in the idea of this was was invented by Dr. Bookwater when he fell asleep at the, as a, I believe as a trainee many many years ago holding the retractor and realised that actually he didn't really need to be there to um, to hold it and that's where he got an, uh, the idea for his um, his invention. So let, let's look at the anatomy of an instrument now. Um, we're on a slide just looking at needle holders, but here you'll see on the left you have. Uh, just a rundown of really some of the basic features of, of an instrument. So you've got the jaw, in this case a needle holder, so you've got tungsten carbide jaws in there, teeth which are cut into the actual jaws themselves, um, the jaws being uh, a separate machined part which, uh, which is um, uh, attached to the, uh, to the device. Um, through vacuum brazing it might have beveled edges which is to prevent the sharpness on, on, the, uh, on the instrument, uh, it might be laser etched, so it might have a catalogue number, a na uh, name of the company who manufactured it. It might have a lot number, CE mark, UK CE marks, all those sort of things you might find on the instrument. These, This is what we call the shanks on the instrument. So when we're setting that device, whether it's an artery forcep or a needle or, or, a, or a needle holder, you'll look down the shanks to line them up, ensure that they're they're uh, appropriately set and and that the ratchets are all could all lock in correctly and there's a little test on noodle holders and artery forceps when you clamp them up if you drop, drop them for sort of from sort of 20 centimeters high onto a non-damaging desktop then they shouldn't pop open so it just just to familiarize you with the different um features there 
and of course two different types of needle holders uh, probably the most popular ones for us Crawwood, which is a delicate needle holder and mayo hagar which is a, a, um, a slightly um, coarser jaw so gold bows on an instrument generally would mean tungsten carbide insert and you'll get this on scissors as well this is mayo hagar i mentioned so here's my here's a metzenbaum scissor with a tc insert it's slightly different on a scissor you'll see here you have a um a needle holder insert which is very very evident you can see this is a separate insert that's that's um that's put in by the manufacturer on a scissor it's um it's a it's i've got a picture on a on a later slide but it's uh, you'll see a very very fine line um where it's um essentially brazed into the scissor and then polished over it's a lot harder to see the insert but you'll know it's there by the fact those gold bows are there and of course on needle holders there's all sorts of different jaws depending on what the surgery is obviously generally the smoother um the smoother the um uh, the needle holder insert uh, the more delicate surgery that there's used on um and the, the coarser you'll get a variety of needle holders on set sometimes depending on what the, the surgeon requires so double black bows what does this mean well this generally means super cut so when you see double black bows on a scissor um, that means that it would have supercut jaws and here are some different supercut uh, supercut scissors steven stenotomy being a very famous one metzenbaum of course a very famous dissecting scissor and this is what supercut looks like so on the left hand side you've got the um, micro serrated edge uh, which is very very fine and and put on by a, um, a specialized machine that that we have in house here and on the other edge on the other side you have a essentially a um it's like a razor cut um edge so the idea is that the grip for the super cut um is the hold the tissue with the serration and then the uh, obviously the ultra fine um like a barber's blade i guess razor edge slices the um slices the tissue for for a perfect cut so they have to be cared for very very carefully so for a bonus point um what does gold and black mean well, of course, it means supercut with tungsten carbide, um, which we don't we don't see that often, but they are out there. Little run down here, uh, it's quite a good graphic. Just to mention the bot one at the bottom right, uh, one black bow on a, on the left ring of the scissor will mean left-handed. So if you've got any of those on your set and you wonder why the surgeon's struggling to cut, the right-handed surgeon's struggling to cut with them, then that may be the case why. So on to coatings now. You, I think. Uh, Commonly, we see a lot of gold on sets, which um, generally will be these sort of gold bows, um, which are just purely to tell you what is um, uh, what type of insert or, or, or what type of um, finish is, is on the end of the scissor or art or um, needle holder. But we're also seeing a lot of different colours now. We see black, which is um, like a ceramic, similar to a titanium nitride coating so titanium nitride is also gold which is rather confusingly um, the gold here used on scissors and needle holders is just generally a gold plating titanium nitride which you might see some kerosene rondures or or some uh, or orthopedic drills and things like that that are coated, coated gold that is a separate ultra hard coating that goes over the surface of the um, surface of the instrument it improves uh, reduces friction it improves the um, how hard the device is itself. It gives an extra tough coating on the outside. So that's why you see it on some kerosens. You'll see a black version of it more, more generally on kerosene rongers. But some people are using these coatings for identifying instruments because um, although it's a fairly costly thing, you can coat the whole instrument and it looks really great visually as well. Um, easy to distinguish the set in that case. That's what some of these gold coatings might look like. Um, just to just to flag up, I mentioned earlier, one um, lucky participant uh, will win the coaching cards. I've got a few that I'm going to show you now, actually, because they're really great references for looking out for key um, key parts maintenance on the instruments. So we're on to maintenance and refurbishment. I will just see if I can just pick up that other question. Bear me a moment. Can you re got a question here just to say can you recycle single use and not fit for purpose instruments 
well, I suppose it depends on the not fit for purpose instruments. It depends who's classified them as not fit for use. Um, if there are people skilled enough to do it, then of course you can recycle, you can uh, refurbish those instruments, um, providing they're brought back to a, a standard that um, is safe and can be tested. Uh, in terms of recycling single-use instruments, I'm pretty sure there's programs out there that, that are able to recycle single-use instruments. Um, I've certainly seen um, a lot of mention of the circular economy and using uh, recycling all instrumentation. So the, obviously the issue is you would have to you would have to reprocess those instruments first before they could go for recycling. But I suppose there's no need no real reason why you couldn't recycle that steel. Um, obviously, depending on the steel used. Uh, generally speaking, with single-use instruments, um, you have uh, well, I, I would think they would meet the um, uh, the ISO to stainless steel grade, but you'd need to check that because that might not be necessary because generally they're not going to be go through the washer disinfectors and be reused. So, providing they're fit for purpose, yeah, then possibly they could be recycled. So, what sort of processes when we're talking about repair and refurbishment are we uh, are we thinking about? We've got likes of sort of resetting, uh, resetting forceps, making sure they're aligning and met the uh, jaws mesh correctly, sharpening, laser welding, vacuum brazing new uh, tungsten carbide jaws on, polishing, cleaning. There's lots, lots of different processes there that uh, a manufacturer or a repairer will carry out to um, to improve um, uh, or, or to, to to refurbish devices and, and get them back fit for fit for use for patients. Another reason why you might refurbishment, refurbish instruments rather than um, uh, obviously keep buying new ones is it requires less energy to do so. Uh, we we conducted a study through Anglia Ruskin University and we found that it's approximately 50% less energy to actually uh, refurbish a, a new an instrument rather than replace it. So it's a significant saving there. So let's have a look at what sort of spot checks you might do on your instruments um, and just really look going back and looking at um, some of the instruments we've discussed already. So here we have a, um, a Mayo scissor, tungsten carbide. You'll see here, this is the seam I'm talking about, where you'll be able to recognise if there's an insert in your scissor, which actually looks quite distinctive here, but sometimes it's not as distinctive. There's some maintenance tips, maintenance tips here as well. Um, so obviously you should make sure that there's no uh, pitting on the instruments, check for cracks, make sure there's no blood in uh, under the scissor joints. Uh, the scissors should operate smoothly. Um, when you've got a tungsten carbide scissor, you make sure there's no uh, the seam isn't splitting or anything like that. So just some general um, some general maintenance tips there. Uh, in the states and I believe Germany, they use testing materials. We don't tend to use those over here in the UK, but um, you know it, I guess it's all time. But it's it's handy if it can be used. Certainly when we're manufacturing and repairing them, we use testing materials. Um, these testing materials are based on a German DIN standard, which is actually um, which is very good for functionality of instruments. And there are different testing materials for different different um, instruments, so it's worth something worth checking out. So artery um, house and mosquito forceps. When you're looking at what to check on them, it's check it, uh, check both both sides of the jaws. The tips should meet evenly up the top. Sometimes you see these gaps up the top where they've come in for repair. Have a have a check for cracks around the box joints. Check, test the ratchet and reset it if it needs to. Remember, I mentioned that they shouldn't, when you drop them from a, a height of about 20 centimetres, they shouldn't jump off the rack. So that's really important. Alice tissue forceps, again, more intricate teeth up the end of the um, uh, device with four into five teeth in this particular one. The teeth should interfit. <clears throat> Excuse me. They won't always interfit perfectly, but generally speaking, when you close down the device, they should interfit because obviously that's what you want it to be to, to be doing when you're using the um, when you're using the instrument. Of course, these are very very fine serrations. You should check in here for potential retention of blood and tissue. Always check for for cracks along the device. Um, and uh, as mentioned, test the ratchet. Dressing forceps. One I particularly like to highlight is you often get cracks down here at the bottom of the uh, of the device after a while they tend to wear and then eventually uh, you tend to get cracks that come off of the rivet the rivet's normally placed around here but that's just generally you know generally can be a wear and tear thing but something to look out for you also tend to get some pitting can can occur down this end as well um, obviously 
goes without saying, check for blood and tissue on all of the on all areas of the devices, um, particularly the serrations. Wheatland, Wheatland retractor here. You've got different uh, areas of fittings here, how the uh, how the, the instruments are fitted together. You want to inspect these um, the different hinges here, make sure that that's free and working correctly. Um, and uh, the lever for the actual ratchet itself, make sure it springs back up. It's got a spring here. You need to check that for cracks as well. If it's cracked, um, the, the retractor won't work correctly because the lever won't operate up and down. So these are some basic things and um, just really, just to familiarize yourself with on, on each device as, as a spot check. And I'm happy to share further information if I need to after this session. So why do we repair devices? Well, we repair devices because we want to put them back to their sort of opt optimum um, clinical performance. Um, this is a scissor here, actually a Stevens tenotomy scissor that, that we found that had been repaired poorly. And um, sorry, excuse me. So it had been repaired poorly. It had been sharpened incorrectly on a, on a very poor quality grindstone. You'll see the multifaceted edge here, horrific grinding marks. And of course, you know, uh, a, a scissor like this is meant for fine tissue dise um, dissection. Who would want to use that? I mean, would you really want that used on a loved one in a hospital? Of course you wouldn't. So they have to, they have to be sharpened correctly. And as I showed earlier, that's what they should look like. And the time should be taken and the money should be spent for them to be done correctly. Um, you know, that's really, really important. But on on um, supercut scissors, you'll just be ruined if they're not sharpened on the correct machinery. Also, if the scissors get too hot, they'll lose their temper. That means they'll become soft and, um, and, and, and useless very, very quickly. So this is what can be achieved through refurbishing. Um, an instrument set here's a mallet a before and after before on the right and after on the left which is probably back to front but there we go um, and you'll just see there that you know we're, we're looking the, the the ability and benefit to remove scratches blemishes re-weld things um, is great because it's all about reusing and not having to replace instruments providing they're safe of course um, it also been mentioned in a study that I picked up um, by Hervé down in Southampton University that Amyloid protein deposits could be found in grooves and scratches on instruments. So refurbishing them as a matter of course and completely refinishing them is really important. And of course, reducing the risk to the patient. Here we have um, uh, pictures of some keratin rongers that have got some carbonized bio burden in them. And in this particular study, this was said to have contributed to a, um, a surgical site infection. So having that regular maintenance, whether it's checking your instruments, particularly things like rongers, where they can they can be a bit tricky to clean, sending them off for routine maintenance, getting them checked, opening them up, having a look correctly, making sure, um, I mean, a lot of kerosens nowadays you can take apart. So make sure you've looked, checked at the IFU, that you've got your manufacturer or instrument provider in to tell you how to take apart correctly, so you can take those apart and clean them because it's a very, very vital part and we don't want to risk seeing things like this inside instruments. And then we've just got a bit of a rogues gallery, really, just to things to look out for that um, I'd like to flag up. Uh, instrument tape, um, saw a post on LinkedIn, I think, this week about this again. Uh, I mean, dreadful stuff. It goes very, very, it goes very, very hard and brittle once it's been washed and altered clay several times, breaks off. You've all get, then got the risk of whatever is hiding underneath here. Um, I mean, can it truly be a sterile service when you've got a sterile surface when you've got instrument tape in place? Probably not. Um, you'll also see here we've got a deteriorated eyelid speculum here that should be a nice bright polish, which this one's nicer, still horrible, but nice. But that's what that one should look like. And that's the sort of thing we've got to be on the look at, look out for that, you know, these um, uh, these surface treatments, this would just be a gold plating. This isn't a, um, this won't be a, a titanium nitride really hard surface um, so it's delicate and it will tarnish and looks like this and again this is like a I don't know a real mess and I'm not sure how that could be could be sterile if it's used on a patient we see a lot of this this is metal on metal um, it's just to say of course if you're if you have a scissor uh, and it has a screw joint if you have a needle holder it has a box joint lubrication is really important um, because you will get these tide marks and um, potentially 
you can get corrosion start forming again if the surface is damaged too much the passive layer is damaged um, obviously this shouldn't be excessive if the instrument is set correct then it, you know, this shouldn't be excessive but of course um, with the instrument going through a variety of different processes it goes in um, goes into an autoclave expands to contract expands correct contracts um, it's not going to be, re re remain the same as when it left the factory so this is something you can help do to prevent this sort of thing which is to lubricate look out for pitting on instruments so this is uh, the ins inside of a sem spore set um, it could clearly be seen where the instrument had been closed up before it had been dried and this is like a pooling mark where water was sitting on a closed device and you'll see that obviously that's happening regularly because you've got a nice little pit mark just starting there um, to form silicates and different sort of uh, psychedelic colors you get on instruments is something that we do see from time to time of course you've got a nice crack on this one as well but interestingly um, we've had uh, multi-colored instruments and people have uh, even requested the finish before but actually it's just a silicate deposit that's come about through uh, through washing the instruments G generally not a harmful thing um, but just something to look out for changes in colors uh, on the whole set is generally something where it's um, something in the wash process um, worth flagging up with your instrument manufacturer and your um, washer disinfector provider, chemical provider to to try and get to the um, try and get to the sort of uh, solution of what what might be causing it. Cracks are, are fairly obvious. I think if you not if you're lucky, you'll find a cracked instrument because that's the wrong term. But at least you can see it visually when something breaks like this. This is where you really want to be using some sort of an enhanced um, uh, magnification to look at the instruments if you have the time to do so to look over those vital parts parts of the instrument to ensure that there's no damage something that might break when the um, when the instruments in use and pitting as I've mentioned um, this is uh, a uh, a very um, great example of, of pitting on the end of an instrument uh, surface finish has got has got damaged, passive layers damaged, and, and generally um, the material started to deteriorate. It can also be where um, perhaps when the instrument's been manufactured, not all these marks have been taken out. So obviously it's a weak point, and and after many years, and often these instruments, as we know, are on sets for sort of 20 years, um, you will start to get this happen. So of course these instruments should be pulled out, and discarded, or or could be potentially refurbished if they're up to it. This is an interesting one that I had on a set. Um, I was shown a needle holder that had rust on the end and we couldn't quite work out why until we put it under a microscope and saw that actually a very, very small part of the tungsten carbide jaw of the needle holder had become chipped off uh, and it had exposed this area here, um, which had become unpassivated or probably was unpassivated surface anyway, and it started to leach rust and free iron. So you'll see that here. So really again reinforces the point of if you you know maybe it's a case of visually having a look at the instrument if you see something you don't quite like the look of then you get out the um uh, obviously the the microscope or um or whatever you're, you you choose to use spotting uh, incorrect stills that have been used on sets as well is, uh, is something that's quite useful i think to for, for you to have in theaters and in, in sterile services uh here we have um a retractor that clearly has had the wrong steel used. This looks like it's probably a mild steel um, screw that's been put in here. Uh, and obviously when it's gone through the wash, it's just gone horrible black rust, as we can see. So um, this is something to look out for. It could be that this was a repair that was done and somebody thought they were being quite helpful in replacing this part, but didn't know enough about the steel to actually put the correct grade of steel in there. I mean, that does often happen quite a lot. Um, and this is another example of what a poor repair of somebody who's perhaps you know sharpening these instruments and doesn't really have an idea about the surface finish. I mean, th there's so many different um, marks down this instrument. Um, obviously, it's gone rusty for starters. This is the start of corrosion along it. You'll also see when you have poor quality repairs being done, the instrument really being start to be dug in there. You'll see that where it's just sharpened on a grindstone very very quickly uh scissor becomes comes to end of life very very quickly uh, complete waste of time if, if it's not being done properly um again 
some soldering. Uh, this is a repair that was that we that we found on on a set. Obviously, there's lots of different watermarks here on the device as well, which should be picked up. But um, the device has been soldered there, and there's and again there's there's some um, and some corrosion started. And it, and it can even happen on the most uh, high quality instruments um, that that you'll get something that you look at and you think, well, why why is that? Why why is that happening? I mean, this is a very, very um, high quality, reputable manufacturer, uh, and there's um, these marks all over the grips. And again, it's a bit of a mystery, but in this case, it turned out that saline was being used um, in these particular surgeries with these uh, with these instruments, uh, cardiothoracic micro instruments. And um, the marks you'll see there are where the saline has um, sat on the instrument grip, not been rinsed off correct. Uh, straight away after use and then started to um, attack the surface of the steel um so yeah and it's it was fairly obvious that this is where the surgeon was gripping the instrument and obviously these contact points were so there's lots of different challenges along the way lots of things to spot um but hopefully these uh these pointers have given you a few things to uh, to think about understanding ifus is uh, a completely um I guess a, almost a qualification in itself in some respects. Um, as I mentioned, if it's if it looks difficult to clean, make sure you speak to the manufacturer and ask them how to clean it. Look at the IFU, make sure it's easy to follow. Um, for instance, something like a kerosene ronger here um, that can be taken apart. You'll see there's a gold trigger on the back. There's normally some sort of indications as to um, uh, as to what part should be moved or should be uh, could be could be taken out and. But it's always worth exploring that and trying to understand the IFU, what it's asking you to do, and and uh, my, I guess equally as importantly, once you've taken that instrument apart, how do you put it back together again? Because that's not always that straightforward. Um, you really want to be um, fluid and have all of your staff fluid with taking the instruments apart, booking back together again, but also be able to recognise what an instrument that's not been put back together correctly looks like. Protecting instruments in sets is is also quite important, and we're seeing that quite a lot now. Delicate instruments, uh, hospitals investing thousands and thousands of pounds on their instrument sets are taking the uh, the step of having delicate instruments put into individual sets. So here you can see um, a set here in using silicone. So you might see that uh, the use of silicone. Obviously, different sized dim baskets are available. Um, the dim baskets might either be wrapped or they might be put in a in a container, but it's really important. Uh, and I guess this is a rare picture in that you've got a whole set that's divided out in silicone. But choosing the, the correct size dim basket, you don't want instruments like if you've got a, um, a set that's got a, cardiova a cardiovascular set that's got like 100 instruments on it. You don't want all the instruments thrown on top of each other because for starters, the delicate ones will get damaged. Um, and you'll potentially get shadow into the instruments may not get decontaminated correctly. So really just something else to consider is how you're um, how you're reprocessing your instruments. Are you using the correct baskets? Could you use silicone fixation or uh, alternative fixation to protect those instruments, such as the fine uh, the fine skin hooks that will poke out the side of the basket and not only be damaged, but potentially hurt somebody. So um, these are all things to think about. Of course, I mentioned that containers are used. Um, obviously, this is one choice. There are, uh, uh, of course, other people may may wrap the sets. And some cool tools to consider when you're uh, when you're having your sort of further reading or, or, or further thoughts around your education on surgical instruments. Um, I mentioned Rick Short's uh, mentoring um, cards, which are excellent. Uh, there's also a book. But there's also test packs. So this is a, a test pack here that has been produced uh, alongside the German DIN standard. And each um, uh, there's a there's a guidebook which comes with it. Each instrument has its own test pieces that are designed specifically for that instrument. So it might be that you maybe um, you don't use the whole thing, but you use certain elements of it, maybe to to look at testing some scissors and to 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 um, to ensure that the correct sharpness. But as I understand in the UK, that isn't something that's done, and that's done generally in theatres. It's pointed out that the instruments need sharpening. Uh, surgical instrument catalogues are a great resource. Uh, that's what ours looks like, our version four catalogue. Um, it's broken down into a number of different sections with education throughout, but it allows you to, to learn the different instrument names, and it's always a great resource. 
ours is available on the website we've also got hard copies if if anyone's interested um further a bit of further reading on the left um association of british health tech instrument and care guide uh, i'll send the link to that um on the right the aki red book german um, manufacturers have produced this red book which give, gives really robust guidance on um, everything to do with surgical instruments really really worth a look if you're experiencing something um, that you're not sure of on your surgical sets this will have some sort of tip or solution um, to enable you to diagnose that so um, I, I highly recommend both those both those publications if you haven't got the link and you want it um, then please ask so that's the end of our webinar thank you very much for listening uh, I'll, I'll hold on a few minutes if anyone does have any questions then please um, please send them over I I've answered all the ones that have come over at the moment oh no I haven't right okay that's great so we've got a few questions to go through uh, so first one here would you recommend to use tungsten carbide instruments rather than stainless steel uh, well, for needle holders, yeah, definitely, because they'll last longer. Uh, you'll buy a stainless steel needle holder with a stainless steel jaw. It it won't last a long time. The reason being is because um, the needle that's used is harder than the stainless steel that's used on the instrument. So the stainless steel on the instrument will, de will, de um, will, will obviously deteriorate and will become softer. Whereas if you use an ultra hard tungsten carbide insert, you won't you won't need that. So hopefully that answers that. Obviously on scissors, the same will apply. It will simply last longer. Uh, got another, so is it possible to have non-CE marked instruments tested and then CE marked? Uh, I'm not quite sure about that as a question really. Uh, uh, Chikwan, if you wouldn't mind just perhaps following up, you, I, I'm not sure entirely what you mean on that one. Um, I mean, you can't if they're if they're not if they haven't been C marked by the manufacturer, you can't get them C marked retrospectively unless they were completely re some sort of complete refurbishment. Although I'm pretty sure they'd have to be C marked in the first place to enable that. So I think no is probably the answer on that one. Oh. Uh, question here: Is it safe to use an instrument that has got rust on it? I mean, there's all. It depends on the levels of rust. It, if it's a slight stain on the instrument, if it's heavy rust, then no, it should be taken off the set straight away and replaced or repaired. Um, but you can get, you may get experiencing some water staining on instruments that can often be cleaned off quite easily with a product such as surgery stain or something like that. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, if you get rust, it should be flagged up. You should deal with it. You should find out why stuff's rusty. Um, last week, I saw a uh, stationary um, bulldog clip on a tray that, that sent a whole tray rusty. So it's all these knock-on effects. Like if you don't deal with the pro deal with the problem and prevent it, then you're potentially opening a, another issue for yourself. So where we have instruments that are no longer in use, uh, I have a mention here of some Cheetle forceps. Can they be recycled? Um, well. I, your best bet, I think, is really, and it's a nice thing to put in place, I think, as a, de as a department for each hospital, is to get in contact with a local scrap person and say, right, we've got these instruments. Can you recycle the materials? Obviously, it gives you the benefit of you have a bit of money into the department, but also that you are recycling those instruments. So, yes, you can recycle instruments, and we have stock that we um, no longer use that we will put off to be recycled. There are a lot of poor quality instruments in circulation. Good quality instruments are easy to reprocess and maintain. What a responsibility of the standards organisation. Um, well, I suppose that because instruments are generally class one in the UK, there isn't much responsibility because um, class one instrument is self-certified. So the responsibility is down to the manufacturer really to produce a, a a product that's fit for purpose obviously being that it's made from the correct steel is that still the right composition so um i would say that if you have 
poor quality instruments, then um, first of all, you need to make sure that that is the reason that you think they, they are poor quality if they're rusty or whatever, because it might not be, it could be another issue such as chemistries or water, as we mentioned. But um, yeah, I mean, ultimately, um, if someone's putting the C mark on the device, they should know that it's the right material. I mentioned you do the due diligence on your um, uh, on uh, on your materials. So as a manufacturer, we do our due diligence on those materials, make sure they're the right composition, so they're going to be fit for purpose. Um, so yeah, I mean, you, you, I think it's just about quizzing the manufacturers and then doing a bit of investigation yourself, really. Uh, and yes, you will get the slides uh, after. We can provide a link. There's somebody's asked for a link for the instrument coaching cards. Um, yeah, of course, I can put that link up as well uh, for the cards and and the other resources I mentioned. Um, if you wouldn't mind, I say, answering the, the questions in the survey, uh, then if we have other educational resources, we can share those for you. That's no problem at all. Uh, ben uh, here from Bora, who I know Ben well, hope you well, Ben. Uh, respect to, it's just adding that respective C marking is impossible. The person wanting to C mark would need access to the technical file for their notified body, which they wouldn't have. Only the manufacturer, oh, sorry, may C mark. There we go. Uh, I'm just going to sort of whiz through these. We got a few coming in, which is great. We found a lot. Of, we found a store of unused instruments that weren't marked. The company they kept said they could. as a bit suspicious. Yeah, I mean that's. If you're not sure of the um, original location of those instruments, then I think and and it's not obvious. Like they're not a really reputable brand. Then C marking them or or going down that road sounds like a very bad idea um, because you're not. You can't guarantee the original um, manufacturing where those were. I'm not sure of this question. I've got a question here around tungsten carbide. Any suggestion how to repassivate the passive layer? Sorry, Roberta, I'm not sure what you're asking me on that one. Um, if you wouldn't mind following up, then I will do what I can to answer. Um, I can pick up these questions after the um, after the, the session anyway, and uh, and hopefully answer them for you. Um, I think that concludes everything. Once again, thanks for joining us. Really uh, delighted we'd have had to have so many um, people interested. If you can fill out the feedback, feedback forms, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, uh, everyone stay well. And um, I look forward to sharing details of our next webinar with you. Thank you.